Welcome back to the Crash Course Podcast. I am Craig Crash Collins. Joined as always by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. The first round of the NCAA tournament is in the books. If you're hearing this on the audio version, if you're watching us live, the Sweet 16 is just nearly set on the NCAA tournament. A lot of madness this March. we got a lot to talk about in that regard. Um, so we're going to talk a lot of basketball, a lot about the NCAA tournament, while also touching on some football as well. The Colts, uh, free agency, as well as NFL free agency on the whole. So a lot to get to today, B. Scott. Yeah, busy, busy, busy time right now with all the sports going on. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're definitely... We have football. We do have football going on, not just free agency talk. You got that division too. FCS. Oh yeah, oh yeah. A lot of a lot of sports going on right now. Running, running. B Scott ragged, as we learned in uh, earlier episodes of the Crash Course podcast. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely want to watch out for that. So uh, you know, it was it was a great. You know, we finally got the NCAA tournament back. Um, it's been you know a lot of fun. Um, you know, watching games finally, getting back into the tournament swing of things, you know, seeing the, the first four on Thursday and then, of course, the start of the tournament on Friday, which kind of threw uh, B. Scott and I off um, as far as, you know, we're used to watching the tournament on Thursday and on, and normally it were the final, you know, the, the Sweet 16 would be set by now. Um, but, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of fun through this first uh, um first couple uh, of days of the tournament but of course we can't talk about the NCAA tournament in the first round without first uh, wrapping up the season uh, for the Purdue Boilermakers unfortunately an early exit at the hands of North Texas um, North Texas wins uh, the 13 seed 78 to 69 over the fourth seed at Purdue um, and really this was a, you know just a surprising effort from North Texas I mean um, you know from the get-go North Texas took command early on this game uh, they took a four to three lead early then led 32 to 24 at halftime Jaden Ivey uh, ties the game at 57 with 324 left in the game um, in overtime, Texas went on an 11-0 run through the first four minutes and 25 seconds of overtime, and then the Mean Green out, uh, to outscored the Boilers by a total of 17 to eight in overtime. So, um, you know, it was just a it was a great effort by North Texas. JV on Hamlet uh, for the Mean Green scored 24 points. Uh, had 12 rebounds. He was averaging 15 points, four rebounds prior to the tournament. Uh, Jaden Ivey, 26 points uh, on the night for Purdue. He averaged 11 points prior to the tournament. And Travion Williams, you know, we talked about him, you know, kind of being around that 15 point mark. Uh, he had 14 points, 12 rebounds, five assists. So, I mean, Purdue had players that performed well. Uh, it was just the Mean Green had players that outperformed what we're kind of used to seeing them do. Um, you know, Purdue scored uh, 37 points in the second half and just seemed to kind of run out of gas as they tried to, you know, chase down the Mean Green. Because, I mean, you it's obviously it's an upset. Obviously, you know, we're talking about a Power 5 school and a mid-major school. But at the end of the day, I mean, it, you're, you're going up against D1 college basketball, you know, athletes you know you, you know it's going to wear you down if you have to try to not only come back but come back from a big deficit i mean scoring almost 40 points in the second half when you only had 24 in the first half i mean they were absolutely exhausted and then hamlet hadn't scored uh 24 points plus since february 27th against marshall and has only scored uh, uh 24 points or more three times this season and that's what march is all about i mean you know it, it's about guys playing uh, up to and higher than what we expect them to play. Um, it's about guys coming out and performing well. Um, and that's just kind of what happened. I mean, you know, it, that's the great thing about basketball is the fact that you're a player or two away from being a contender and you're a player or two away from having a, a successful season. Um, you know, I mean, obviously it takes an entire team, but if you have that one standout player, that one standout performance, it can really turn the tide for you. And that's what happened uh, with North Texas. Of course, they end up uh, losing in the second round to uh, Villanova. Would have loved to see what that Villanova-Purdue matchup would have looked like. Uh, but we don't get a chance to see that one. Uh, but the good news for Purdue, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, making the outline uh, yesterday for the podcast. And I was like, you know, talking about Purdue reminds me a lot of how we talk about the Pacers 
in the sense that we're like, yeah, it was a great season. They did a lot of great things. Uh, you know, really surprised with what they did. Future's bright. Ending was super disappointing, but you know what? Next year, there's a lot of bright spots, and we'll, we'll just run it back next year, which is what I feel like we always are saying about the Pacers. We're always like, fantastic season. Ending was super disappointed. You know, stinks to see, uh, you know, another sweep. But, you know, hey, we're, we're going to come back next year and hopefully not get swept again in the first round. So uh, that's kind of how it feels. But, yeah, Purdue, no seniors, so they're going to bring a lot of players back, run it back next year, uh, and be really strong. I mean, you look at where this Purdue – and I'm sure you're going to get into it more, B. Scott, but you look at where this Purdue team, um, what, uh, you know, where they were at the beginning of the season and where they ended up. I mean, still an impressive run. Um, and still, you know, nothing to, uh, nothing to, uh, you know, be, you know, ashamed of at all. Nothing, nothing to hang your head about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, other than you got, you were an upset. Well, right, right. But, you know what, this year with the NCAA tournament, it's just so weird this year. There's, there's so many double-digit seeds advancing every day. I mean, we were one three-minute claps from Rutgers away from having an entire region, Sweet 16, be double-digit seeds. Had Rutgers not collapsed in the final three minutes to Houston, that's the way – I think it was the Sweet 16. Yeah, Sweet 16. We would have had an entire region's Sweet 16 be double-digit seeds. So, you know, it, it's it's just something that's just happening to everybody. And to be honest, this Purdue team, they were either going to fall out in the first round or make it all the way to the Sweet 16. You know, it, it was one or the other. There wasn't going to be any in between. And um, so I, I am I, was I bummed? Yeah, I didn't get to watch any of the game. I was working, so... <laughs> thank goodness but um i guess i'm not too surprised at the same time if you look at it this team is extremely young loaded with freshmen there are only three players on this roster that have any tournament experience and when that experience that they have is from when they were freshmen and purdue made a run to the elite eight so i mean that's good experience but you know this is their first time truly having to lead a team in the NCAA tournament. So, I mean, this was like a a fresh team, essentially there. Um, I wouldn't really consider this kind of like talking about the Pacers at the end of every season, because you know the Pacers aren't bringing anything anything in over the off season because they're too cash strapped and nobody wants, you know, everybody just wants to go play in three destinations. Um, Whereas Purdue has a very good recruiting class coming in, two top 40 players coming in at areas of need, um, I guess, areas of need. And then the, you know, the growth we've seen from Jaden Ivey and Zach Eady and Brandon Newman this year have been really encouraging, almost a little bit ahead of schedule perhaps, especially with Zach Eady. And then next year you should see more from um, highly regarded point guard, Ethan Morton, who was out a lot this year because he had COVID and mono. I mean, those are two things, the very tough things to overcome and you know get your stamina and energy and every anything back from that uh for a while so i think purdue when i look at purdue's future i it's not i'm not looking at it like i typically do with the pacers you know like oh there's always next year well with purdue you know we knew going into this season purdue fans knew this wasn't going to be a year this wasn't going to be a contend for really anything the fact that purdue finished fourth in the big 10 was a top four seed was you know one of the it was a four seed in the ncaa tournament that was a a surprise to be honest because coming into this season purdue was picked i think to finish like seventh or eighth in the big 10 so ex- they, they exceeded expectations and then you know so you can't really look at this team and go well that was a huge disappointment i mean yeah it was disappointing but it wasn't a disappointment because this team exceeded expectations for this season everybody knew that it wasn't about this year it's about next year it's really about 2022 23 because that's the year that you know there's going to be the experiences is going to be unbelievable on that roster barring any transfers obviously in the new transfer era um so i mean i'm not disappointed i i guess this year for me looking at the ncaa tournament it's different because i to this point, I've only watched four minutes of one game. 
I watched the last four minutes of Illinois versus Loyola because I saw on Bleacher Report that it was it was turning into an upset. So I was like, well, I've got time now. Let me just turn it on real quick. I mean, I, I was working Thursday, Friday, and Saturday all day. So I didn't I didn't get to watch any basketball and it's just it's crazy. I mean, you just I mean, you're going to talk about it here in a second, but just the the number of upsets that we've seen, it's just a totally different type of year. And even today there there's been some. I mean, well for for instance, the Big 10 as a whole, what is going on? Yeah. I mean, seriously, today Iowa just got bludgeoned by Oregon. I mean, here we are talking about never well of course we we were talking saying never trust the Big 12 and well duh (laughs) big 12 is falling apart but who would have thought you know the 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 strongest conference in all of college basketball this season the big 10 is absolutely floundering and the weakest conference of the power five conferences in all of college basketball is thriving the pac 12 is like showing their muscle all of a sudden it's i mean tonight oh i mean we have oregon state going to the sweet 16 ucla right. going to the sweet 16 it's like where did this all come from yeah it is pretty wild we have uh dusty up in the chat uh you know he all he comes in to say roll tide uh you know big alabama fan but he also asked you know you know speaking of the uh, speaking of upsets it's right along the same line um you know what are what are the chances that loyal chicago could possibly shock the world and go all the way i don't think they're going to go all the way and win the tournament but heck i mean the way it's going they could be a final four team which bra- who who do they have? I don't. So I don't, so their know. region they've got they're they're gonna play Oregon State next week, which I mean I, thought, I yeah. think they can beat Oregon State. Right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like you know both teams have have been upset teams. So which do you want to? Both teams are hot right now. So which no, do you go you gotta, with? I'm going with Loyola just because there's just some they right. they, they kind of have that old Butler magic. Right. Them, to be honest. That and then they've got Syracuse, the winner of Syracuse and Houston, which that'll be tough. But I think I so think. Wait. That that's to get to the final four. Yeah, I would put money on that. I would put money on Loyola to the final four. Yeah. Now, of course, then they would play the uh, uh, winner Sister out of Jean's in town. Man, yeah. Sister Jean is in town. <laughs> yeah, they would then Sister Jean's in town. You know they're gonna roll. <laughs> they're gonna play uh, the winner of the South region if they get to the final four, which still oh, has Baylor. Arkansas, Baylor. Uh, Villanova, Oral Roberts. So, gonna, well, I, I'm not. I'm sorry, I'm not counting Oral Roberts. I mean, well, I mean, you, hey, they hey, beat Ohio you State. Know what? I honestly did. I honestly did believe. You know, okay, so Ohio State made that really good run though in the Big Ten tournament, right? But to close out the regular season, Ohio State. Yes, I'm wearing Ohio State right now, but a uh, different sport. But Ohio State did not look all that good at the end of the regular season. I honestly was surprised that they still stuck at the two line. I mean, obviously, they're running the Big Ten tournament help, but typically the Big Ten tournament doesn't sway the committee at all right. and from what we've seen in the past. So for Ohio State to you know still land on that two line with how bad they looked at the end of the season, I thought that was a, that was very, very generous. So... Was Oral Roberts over Ohio State still an upset? Oh, yes. Yes, it definitely was, no matter what, because, you know, mid-major over Big Ten, yeah, we're, we're going to call it an upset all day, every day. But that wasn't a, a two-seed Ohio State. That really yeah. wasn't. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry to uh, to sorry to our Ohio State fans, uh, because, you know, P. Scott and I were Apparently looking over. we have a lot of them. We have, yeah. Our, our, we got a lot of love over in Columbus, so uh, OH, now I guess. Now we're going to get even more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shout out to Columbus. Shout out to good old Columbus, Ohio. Good old C-Bus. Here we go. <laughs> uh, OH. But, but, yeah, I mean uh, – I, I mean, that's a. I think I, I like Loyola's chances to get out of uh, what region is that? The Midwest. I don't yeah. know after that how that will go, but I definitely think they could go at least out of that. They could make a run to the Final Four easily. No, I'm saying I'm saying they will. I'm saying I like their chances to make it into yeah. the Final Four. Just don't know after that when they have to play Baylor, potentially oh, no. Gonzaga or Michigan in the cha- You know, whoever in the but, championship. Do you know what? I look at Baylor and Illinois, and they're very similar teams. True, in my opinion. And Loyola made Illinois, who I, I actually had Illinois winning the national championship. Yeah, so did I. And I mean, because looking at Illinois, the way they've played at this last month, they looked unbeatable. 
to me. And for this to happen is, was kind of shocking. This is probably, to me, this is the biggest, that was the biggest surprise. Yeah, looking at uh, you know the upsets from this past weekend, we got number 15, Oral Roberts, over number 2, Ohio State. Number 12, Oregon State over Tennessee. I mean, even though... Even though Oregon State was a Pac-12 champion, even though it's a mid mate or a, excuse me, a Power Five over Power Five, I mean that's still you know a low seed. That, I mean, 12 seed is pretty much the lowest you can go as a Power Five school. So it's basically on that like mid-major border um, of where you get seeded in the tournament. Um, so that was a good win by them. A- Abilene Christian over number three Texas, Ohio over Virginia, uh, and Loyola over Illinois. So um, you know, talk about you. You know, when you mentioned the biggest surprise for me biggest surprise for me is uh, i'm gonna give you know yeah oral roberts you know being a sweet 16 team is pretty crazy abilene christian beating texas of course they lose to ucla um um you know here uh, earlier uh in the round of 32 um so those are some big ones obviously loyola beating illinois too because that was the team that um, you know, I, you know, what you had him winning the championship and so did I, as far as Illinois goes. Um, but I'm, I'm going to give my, uh, Maction guys some love here. I'm going to go with Ohio or Virginia. The Bobcats finished fifth in the Mac. So this isn't like, oh, well, you know, cause typically, I mean, when you talk, you know, really good Mac teams, I mean, this year Toledo was at the top of the list. So that, that's usually, that's kind of an anomaly Purdue or uh, Purdue Toledo is not typically, uh, you know, top of the Mac is usually Kent State or Akron or Buffalo. Um, so we don't usually talk about, um, you know, I mean, Ohio's been a good uh, basketball school before, but they, this year they were fifth. Um, so it wasn't like a top four, top three team in the Mac that gets there. Prior to the Mac tournament, Ohio played three games since February 2nd. There's a lot of postponements and cancellations in there that kind of, you know, mucked up their schedule a little bit. Um, and then they won three games in the MAC tournament by an average of nine points all over a higher seeded team. So nearly 10 point digits um, as they started to get, you know, a 10 point wins as they started to get hotter uh, throughout the uh, tournament season. And in the last two games for Virginia, I mean, there were wins over Syracuse, who's a Sweet 16 team, and Louisville, who is a tournament alternate. I mean, not anymore um, because there's now just going to be, you know, uh, now just forfeits, but Louisville was on the, on that cusp of be, being a tournament team. Um, and so, I mean, you know, the Bobcats also shot 42% from the field and 30% from three, from uh, beyond the arc. So, I mean, the Bobcats played really well. Uh, I'm excited to see now, of course, if you're listening to this on audio or watching the YouTube video the next day, they've, they may have already lost, um, you know, the, uh, in their opportunity to go to the sweet 16, um, as they, oh, they, they did lose. Sorry, they did lose earlier uh, to Creighton. I, I was like, I thought that game was going on already. Um, you know, but they so they end up losing to Creighton. But I mean, the fact that o, that Ohio was able to do what they did against a Virginia team that like. You know, because we even talked about it last week that Virginia being a four seed was maybe a little bit on the lower side um, of what, you know, we expected them to be. You know, they were the best team in the ACC. ACC and Big Ten are are comparable conferences um, as far as, you know, being at the top of of the basketball world. So uh, pretty crazy uh, that... Um, Ohio was able to get that win, um, you know, and, and busting up a lot of brackets there because I, I know a lot of people probably had Virginia getting at least uh, to this uh, round of 32 matchup against Creighton. So good win by Ohio. Yeah, you know, it is a great win by Ohio. I'm not that surprised that Ohio advanced, though. I mean, look at the circumstances surrounding Virginia. They got into the bubble the night before, True. late the night of, of the night before the game because of some COVID issues. So they were not at 100%. They were um, tired, they, you know, just they got, they got in essentially. Um, for, like I said, for me, my biggest surprise, my, my two biggest surprise probably, I mean, I don't know really, I mean, I guess Loyola over Illinois is a, was a big surprise. Um, but I mean, we all knew Loyola was good. Loyola was top 25 this year. I mean, yeah. they were a top 25 team. So we can't really look at that and go, whoa, what happened? Like they were an eight seed. You know, last time they made a run, they were a, they were a double digit seed, but an eight seed, they're, that's respectable. Um, for me, I would have to say the biggest one though was Ab- Abilene Christian over Texas. That one, I mean, I, I had Texas making it to the elite eight. I mean, I really strongly considered having them get to the final four because of the injury to Isaiah Livers with uh, Michigan. Um, actually, I may have. 
I, I don't remember. It's been, I'll tell you what, last, last week was like three weeks within one for me. Um, so I really don't remember. Um, but Abilene Christian over Texas was, uh, was honestly my biggest surprise. Um, I thought Shaka Smart actually had this team figured out this year. But at the same time, though, I mean, look at that. 15 over 2, 12 over 5, 14 over 3, 13 over 4. And then you had 14 over, you had, uh, yeah, 13 over 4 at, with Purdue. I mean, it's just unreal the amount of double-digit seeds we have seen move on this year. It's been so much more than normal. And just welcome to 2020, continued into 2021, I guess. Yeah, I uh, I saw a... Um... A tweet today by uh, a former uh, colleague of ours at Ball State. Do you remember Tim Keen? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. I was in Sports Link with Tim Keen. I mean, I figured, man, but I just, I, I, dude, it's been so long. Like, it's crazy to think that I was in. I mean, it's been longer for you, I know, because you're old. But like, and so am I now. We're both hey, over thirty. Hey, we went to Ball State <laughs> at the same time. We I did. Was old men, too. I, I know exactly. But that's what I'm saying is that like it's it's like I forget like who was where as far as because like I remember Tim Keen, but I guess theoretically if I remember him, uh, then you should too because you were there at the same time I was. So no, we got we we we, 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 digr- we digress. Um, but he he sent out a tweet earlier today and I responded to it and it was very interesting. Um, as far as he was like you know is. This is the amount of upsets we're seeing this season. Is it a result of um, just the NCAA selection committee just seeding like poorly, um, or like not really evaluating teams the way that they should? And and the way that I thought of it was was like this. For one, I mean, you know, a typical tournament year, Power Five conferences uh, will be one through twelve. So uh, you're hard pressed unless you're a Gonzaga and unless you're a Loyola, unless you got some cred. On, on your profile um, in the tournament. The then, Loyola doesn't have that much credit. Well, but I mean, they have, they're, they're like a recency bias, you know, what they did a few years ago, what was that, 2018, 2016, what, you know, somewhere in there. It, it, it's, yeah. it's recent enough to where, like, you, you, if you're, you know, one of those schools, then you're going to get a little bit more credit. Um, and, and be higher than a 13 seed. But if you're a mid-major school, no matter what, no matter how good you are, unless you're one of those schools that has a little bit more, uh, you know, you know, credentials, then you're going to be 13 or lower. That's just how it usually goes. Uh, and then as far as you know, evaluating seeds, I mean, you know, we this year in college sports in general, the weird like conference only. I mean, I know there were some non-conference, but conference only scheduling. I mean, you can only go off of what you, you know, if your conference is weak, it doesn't matter really how good you are. I mean, maybe Oregon's better than a seven seed, but they went against the Pac-12, which is, I mean, I guess stronger than we thought. But previously, you know, we thought was, you know, one of the worst conferences in all of college sports. I mean, as far as major college sports go. Um, And then you have, you know, the Big Ten who, you know, has a team, like people were thinking Michigan State was going going to go on a run and they're an 11 seed. So, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of a crazy thing where you you don't really know how to. You, there's going to be a little bit more flawed logic in how you see teams and how you evaluate teams when they only go up against their own conference. Because again, like we said for football, I mean, you know, you, conference going up against teams from your conference adds a little bit more, you know, pizzazz, a little bit more pep in your step. You're gonna come and play that game a lot harder uh, because it's against your conference foes. So you know, it's it's kind of harder to evaluate you know if you are if there was already kind of a stigma against that conference or a you know a if that conference is in high regard you're going to regard a team that went you know 500 or a little bit above in the big 10 then you are a team that maybe only had five or six losses in the pac-12 so um i I think it's just kind of the weird covid year i think next year it i mean i don't know i mean i can't say we're not going to see as many upsets in next year's tournament i mean it it is march madness and you know it is the first time that you i mean because again these these they're these some of these teams are in a tournament or in the uh, NCAA tournament year after year and not to say that it's not as important to them as it is some of these smaller schools but these smaller schools you also take away the fact that these smaller schools get up for these games I mean they they you know it's talked about you know in mid major you know circles that like hey the conference tournament is your NCAA tournament that's you know when you win that 
The rest is just gravy. Because no one expects you as Ohio to beat Virginia. Nobody expects you as Abilene Christian to beat Texas. So you're not playing for anything other than, I mean, obviously a right to go to the Sweet 16, but also just more or less just like you're playing for just bragging rights basically at that point as far as like trying to um you know whereas another team like a texas like a virginia has expectations they have something they, more to play for something more expected of them so I, I don't know i think it's just the fact that it's a weird covid year that's what makes it a, a you know not as fine-tuned of a seeding as maybe we've seen in past years but i think uh, at the end of the day i think this has just been a, a wacky tournament <laughs> Yeah, it has. And, you know, when it comes down to the seating and everything, um, what makes this year so tough, I would say, is the fact that, um, you know, like you, you, you said, there, the non-conference year season was shortened. And um, even, I mean, it, it really, really, truly affected the smaller mid-major schools because they saw so many of their games get canceled. The bigger school said, you know what, we're just not going to risk it this year and we're not going to have that game. You know, yeah, we may, we're, we'll figure something out, but it really affected those schools. So there wasn't really much to go on. So when you're looking at the power five schools and you see the big 10 slugging it out, the ACC slugging it out and the SEC slugging it out, and same thing with the big 12, you look at the smaller conferences and you go, there's such parity between the top and the, even the second place in those, it's going to be hard to really grasp what those teams fully can do unless you really deep dive into the statistics and, you know, trying to do that on a shortened season with non con with hardly any non-conference play. That's just really a difficult thing to do. So I think first and foremost, what we just got to do is we just have to look at this season as a, Thank goodness the tournament was able to even happen. We got it to be done. We're going to crown a national champion and probably one of the, the one remaining one seeds or two seeds is going to get it, end up getting it. I mean, Michigan's still in it. Baylor looks really good. It's going to probably come down to Baylor and Gonzaga. Let's just be honest. That's probably what's going to happen. And, you know, nope, that's no problem. I mean, that's ultimately in the end, those were the two best teams from start to finish this season. So, we're going to get a true national champion out of this year. We need, and I, I think there's been a lot of good lessons learned about this season, some good things to work upon for next year. If you know, this pandemic thing continues um, how we can make things better. I mean, obviously you look at the different sports, like, you know, wrestling. So basketball has had several uh, positive tests. We all, we all know that there was officials that got kicked out early on for testing positive or being close contact with somebody that tested positive. VCU has had issues. Virginia couldn't even get in till the night before their game. And I just got off the wrestling championship and throughout that entire tournament, uh, according to ESPN that throughout that entire tournament, there were zero, zero cases of work from workers, officials, wrestlers, anything like that. So there's things to learn from all the different scenarios going on right now within the NCAA. And there's going to be a lot of great lessons to, to be learned from it, as, from it. Um, things, changes will be made, different things like that. So it's, it's, go, it's good for the future going forward. I mean, it's also one of those, hey, do we look at potentially having the tournament all in one location going forward in, in cities? it's not a bad idea um you know so that because that does limit the travel some it, it you know that helps you know so there's different things to look at i think this is kind of just a, a growing year to be honest and um just glad that we're even able to have this yeah i think it's it's also yeah you know, like you said you know in a way kind of bouncing off of that just kind of just a knee-jerk reaction to so many upsets but you're right i mean at, at the end of the day the cream of the crop even if it is like well, you know, we talked about it. Loyal was, was ranked. You know, they're probably the favorite to win that, you know, that side of the bracket. You know, Houston's been good all year. They're probably the second favorite. Houston favorite. Loyola matchup's going to be good. Yeah. And then you've got, um, you know, Baylor still strong, you know. So, yeah, and Gonzaga getting there. So, at the end of the day, the cream of the crop will will rise as far as, you know, um, you know, I, you know, so I, it, like it does all the time. So all those uh, cliches there. Um, uh, so one thing to look at uh, your uh, the biggest disappointment from the tournament so far for me. Um, you know, looking at that side of thing has to be um, Illinois losing. Um, you know, it's just shockingly enough. 
it's not me picking uh, Georgetown as my biggest lock ever picked on Crash Course and then them getting beat, I think, by double digits by Colorado. Um, so, I mean, you could, I guess, just lock that in. Um, but, yeah, Illinois losing, um, upset by uh, Loyola. They never led. They couldn't seem to cut into the deficit. Uh, they hovered around 7 to 10 points most of the game. Uh, and the Big Ten is struggling. I mean, like you said, I mean, you know, Iowa loses. You've got Rutgers, you know, coughing up their lead late. You've got Wisconsin. I mean, we didn't expect Wisconsin to beat Baylor if they were able to get past North Carolina, but that's another team that's out. Illinois gets upset. Purdue gets upset. Ohio State gets upset. Um, Michigan, you know, last I checked, I'll check back in on them now as they're currently playing. Um, they you know, last, you know, they were losing by one to LSU. Um, so, I mean, there's a chance – uh, L- LSU right now leads 63-58. to 58. Um, I'm seeing uh, with about 10 minutes to go in the second half as we're recording the podcast. So, I mean, you know, there's a chance that, you know, when this podcast, you know, hits the airwaves tomorrow that there are going to be zero Big Ten. T- I mean, because, I mean, yes, Maryland also plays Alabama, but, I mean, that's kind of a long shot. So, I mean, there's a, there's a possibility that there could be zero Big Ten teams in the Sweet 16, whereas, like you were talking about, the Pac-12, I mean, they already have one, two teams in the Sweet 16 with Oregon and UCLA. Um, you know, they've got Colorado still yet to play. Oregon State's already in there. You've got the SEC, who could have two teams with Arkansas, and Al- or does have one team with Arkansas and, and uh, Alabama. Um, you know, so it's, you know, the Big East has two. Um, so, I mean, it's it's been just kind of a, a wacky tournament for the Big Ten and just kind of a disappointment all around because, you I mean, you thought Big Ten, you usually think Big Ten, best uh, conference in college basketball, and it just hasn't been so uh, in the tournament. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that you know, that's one of, that's one of the things I got I to gotta think about is, you know, is the Big Ten one of those conferences that they just beat up on each other too much? And, you know, and I don't think it's because of the teams. I think it has a little bit to do, or a lot to do, really, with I mean, the officiating in the Big Ten. They don't – well, it, sometimes they do. But they tend to not call things as tightly as, say, you know, the ACC or the SEC or anything like that. So you almost wonder if these Big Ten teams are get accustomed to one style of officiating and it really ends up hindering them um come tournament time i don't know i mean they do have to deal with bo borowski who likes to insert himself into the game notes as a superstar um he wants his time in the sun but um yeah i don't know what it is about the big time because seriously 2000 was it 2000 was the last time a big 10 team has won a national championship i know it's michigan state and was here in indianapolis so yeah 2000 yeah, well, twenty-one year drought. That know, doesn't mean, I mean the Big Ten. No, Ohio State got beat by Florida, didn't they? Yeah, every, okay. It's not, the Big Ten has made it to the national championship right. game on several occasions. It was IU in 02. Can, oh, by by reverse, can uh, the Big Ten claim Maryland? Maryland? Yeah, I was gonna say Maryland in two thousand two. That was yeah, hey, still, that was an all Big Ten national championship with IU and Maryland. But still, that was nineteen years. Well, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but, okay, we went from twenty one years to nineteen years. Hey, improvement. Um, <laughs> you know, and how many? I mean, they've come close a couple times, yeah, obviously. With Michigan, um, hey, Michigan technically Louisville vacated, so Michigan gets it right. Is that how that works? That game doesn't exist. I know. <laughs> that never happened. It's like that movie uh, Shazam. You think it happened with Sinbad, but it never existed. I was going to say, like, existed. Men in Black, they just took the little, like, pin thing and flashed your memory. You're like, nope, yeah. it's not. <laughs> what are you talking about yeah. Michigan versus World National That didn't happen. That never happened. <laughs> never. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, Big Ten's come close a couple times. I mean, Mich- how many times has Michigan State made the, the national championship game since then? Um, how many times has Michigan made it? Uh, right. Ohio State. I mean, it, uh, Illinois. I mean, Illinois lost to uh, a North good Carolina. North Carolina yeah. team even. Um, that was a good Illinois team that probably should have won. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what it is with the Big Ten. I guess – I don't – it's just – I feel like it's a crapshoot when it comes to the NCAA tournament. You just got wh- whoever's hot. I mean, seriously, as Purdue fans, that's one thing we've always said. It's like your path has to really play out very well, 
or you just got to get damn lucky. Yep. <laughs> Plain and simple. I mean, that, that's kind of just the way it is sometimes in this tournament, because like you said, the smaller teams, they do play up. This is a big, big deal for them. Heck winning a, an upset game is like winning the national championship to them. Whereas these bigger schools, it's like, no, I got to make the final four or else it's not a success. Well, and you know that if you're a bigger school, I mean, Virginia, I mean, Virginia, Virginia is just drawing, you know, bad luck, you know, here and there all over the place. They're the first one seed to lose. I mean, um, imagine carrying that weight. Like when you're down, if you, if you, you know, a team plays up to you, like we don't want to be, you know, on that list. We don't want to be, we don't want to be in CBS's montage um, you know, when a team that is a lower seed is up on a team from a higher seed, we don't want to be on that, you know, Northern Iowa, you know, over Kansas or, you know, the, all the, all the, you know, UMBC over Virginia. We don't want to be on that montage that CBS runs every year when you look at tournament teams. So, I mean, there's a lot more to lose for obviously, I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious to say, but like, it's, there's more on the line and more to lose for a bigger seed than a smaller seed. Yeah, but if I if I had to pick, if somebody comes to me and said, okay, you can make a run to the Sweet 16 every year, uh, one year get into the Elite Eight, or you can get one year get bounced as a one seed by a 16 seed, the next year win a national championship, and then the next time you're in the tourney, you get bounced in the first round again. I think I'm going to take option oh, two. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. mean, I'm still, I want that banner more than I, I care oh, yeah. about making the runs to the Sweet 16 or Elite Eight, let's be honest. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Real, real quick here, because we've run a little long about the NCAA tournament, but one one thing uh, we want to, uh, to watch for in the Sweet 16, I mean, we already talked about uh, Loyola um, possibly making their run to the Final Four. You know, looking at some of these other teams that, um, you know, are – um you know have a shot here i think um i think next week when we talk about or, or starting to get into uh of course we'll be talking about baseball next week but next week um you know i i think you know looking at the rest of the tournament i think uh, i think creighton's gonna be gonzaga that's gonna be my thing to watch for um in uh well, i mean creighton's a really good team creighton was up right. there in the i think they were top 10 for, at one point this yeah. year yeah yeah they yeah they were i don't uh, maybe not that far but they were definitely top 15 it, yeah, top 15. So sure. I'm going to go create – I mean, I wasn't necessarily looking for a pick here, but I just, you know, kind of looking over it quickly because, um, I mean, I don't – I, I, I just kind of going out on a limb. I think Creighton beats Gonzaga. It's the kind of crazy tournament we've seen um, so far. So I'm going I'm going Creighton there. You know, I'm, I'm going to look for the continued success of Syracuse because, like I said last week in our bracket show, I always, I always ride with Syracuse no matter what, it seems like, and they always burn me. So let's see if they actually do it this year. All righty, so you know a lot of stuff going on with the tournament right now. Uh, very excited, of course. The MCT podcast boys will also be talking uh, tournament as that goes along. So make sure you're on the lookout for that as well. So very excited there. Uh, but before we shift gears into NFL free agency, let's get a word from our friends of the show. The Crash Course Podcast is brought to you by Anchor. Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to start? Look no further than Anchor.fm. Anchor allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or mobile device and will distribute it to other sites such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. On a budget, not only is Anchor completely free of charge, but will allow you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Anchor, it's everything you need in a podcast in one place. Are you tired of your same old lunch hour of sitting and scrolling through your apps on your smartphone? Have you thought about playing a board game with your coworkers? Eat Lunch and Board Game is a podcast dedicated to telling you about board games that are great for lunchtime fun and some that are probably better saved for after work hours. I've been playing games at my office for over four years now where I have made new friends and business connections that have been very useful. Board games build bridges. All right, so we've talked about the NCAA tournament. Now it's time to shift into some NFL free agency, and it has been um, a wild start to the NFL, uh, you know, signing period, you know, year. It's been, a, you know, the calendar year for not calendar year, but the NFL year has begun. It's on. It's going on strong right now. Uh, a little bit of breaking news here: uh, the Colts did sign Sam uh, Tevy, uh, former Chargers uh, uh, offensive tackle, left tackle. So. I don't think he's the left tackle of the future, but uh, 
Definitely. Who? Yeah, I know. I don't know who what, he is. Okay. What is it with us picking up the scraps of the Chargers? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was I was kind of thinking the same thing because we also have uh, uh, Isaac Rochelle uh, from the Chargers. Don't even. Don't even I'm, I'm. Honestly, honestly, I'm. I'm getting frustrated. So. To be honest. Well, the way I look at it is, I mean. It is it is frustrating. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not going to say, um, you know, that I'm also uh, that I'm not frustrated myself with how uh, it's gone. Um, it's one of those things because the way I think about it is that, like, Chris Ballard is kind of like a magician in the sense that, like, you know, at the end of the day, he's going to, like, pull the rabbit out of his hat and he's going to be like, ooh, look, it's, you know, look at this. And we're going to be like, Chris Ballard does it again. Uh, where, But, yeah, like, I... but the thing is, is that, like, there's there's a difference between being frugal and trying to get like not get into a bad deal and saving money to you know sign Quentin Nelson Darius Leonard and just blatantly being patient for the sake of being patient um, and that's kind of what's happening um, the way I look at these signings is depth uh, you know you want to you know bring some more guys in the building they're young players I mean. Uh, Rochelle was a, you know, looking at it here, I mean, Rochelle is uh, a seventh round pick out of Notre Dame in 2017, so I mean, you know, you bring him in, maybe he's great, maybe he's not, it's it's a very low level signing, it's not anything too crazy, um, and same with Tevi, I mean, you know, he's I don't think he's going to be the starting left tackle, he's not going to be Anthony Costanza's replacement, but hey, it, it adds more depth, and if, if you get something out of it, great, if not... Um, no big deal, but you look at what the Colts have done so far. It's not a lot. They re-signed Marlon Mack and Xavier Rhodes. Really excited about one-year deals. One-year one year deals. Right. I mean, I, I. We're gonna do this dance again next year. I guess, but I. I, I mean, I, I, not, I, I think Marlon Mack. It's more of a hey, this is our, our courtesy thing for your career. But with Xavier, I mean, come on. Are we really gonna do this again next year? Colts still need help at cornerback because Chris Ballard can't draft it for some reason and decides that uh, your best corner, you're just going to keep signing to a one-year deal. Like, come on. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm with you on that one. I mean, Marlon, Matt, at Marlon. Two year, at least a two-year. True, you yeah. You know, give us some consistency. Yeah. You know, that it's. Yeah, Xavier Rhodes is a little bit of a, a head scratcher as far as not signing him for longer. But as far as Marlon Mack, I mean, this is kind of what we expected. We expected if he was going to re-sign with the Colts, he was going to sign a one, excuse me, a one-year prove-it deal. Um, you know, because if he goes out and has an amazing season, um, then there's a, you know he he has the opportunity to go bet on himself next year in free agency again. Um, and if he, he has does that opportunity this year. Well, right, but he was hurt, though. Oh, like, I thought you were talking about Xavier Rhodes. I'm no, no, no. Rhodes, uh, no, I, I switched over to Marlon Mack. Yeah, Marlon Mack has that opportunity to kind of bet on himself. If I said Xavier Rhodes, I didn't mean Xavier Rhodes. I meant, uh, I meant to say Marlon I Mack. I agree on Marlon Mack. So yeah, I so, totally yeah, one-year prove-it deal. He's going to go out and have a good, you know, if he has a strong year, great. If not, you could probably get him for cheaper next year and re-sign him again. Uh, to maybe a two-year deal with you know that for less money overall, um, as far as like on average over those two years, um, you know, and then the departures though are are big ones. I mean, you have Danico Autry to the Titans, three years, uh, twenty-one and a half million. Uh, he had seven and a half sacks in twenty twenty. Anthony Walker to the Browns, one year, three and a half mil. I mean, you definitely had the money to re-sign Anthony Walker. Not really sure uh, why the Colts didn't do that, especially you know with. Three, it only being three and a half million. I mean, he was second on the team in tackles with 92 um, in 2020. So, I mean, you know, looking at it, the Mac, uh, Marlon Mack, Jonathan Taylor combo will be a force um, next year, and I think it is going to be really good in taking the pressure off of Carson Wentz. Uh, you know, obviously they still have you know some issues on the line to address um, to make that a viable thing to to talk about. But I think the fact that you know. You're, you have a strong running game. It's going to mean that Carson Wentz will not have to be a guy that has to throw, 
you know, high 30s, low 40s, 50s, as far as the amount of passes he's got to throw, he can have a, a very consistent offense that's very balanced. Um, Xavier Rhodes, um, you know, coming back, you know, whether, you know, even though it is only on a one-year deal, it is a big sigh of relief. Glad that the Colts were able to get him back. But as far as the defense is concerned, I mean, you know, losing out on Danico Autry and Anthony Walker um, is going to be tough. I mean, especially because, like I said, Anthony Walker signs for cheap with the Browns. So, I mean, you definitely could have gotten him back, and R- Rochelle well, is unproven. But we all, Well, no, Rochelle is a D-N. Walker's a linebacker. Well, I know that, but I'm saying... Knew, we all knew coming into this offseason, yeah, we would love to have Anthony Walker back, but listening to Frank Reich, he even stated that that's looking like that's going to be unlikely. I was just saying from, like, what they've done defensively, you know, what they've... You know, they added Rochelle, which is an unknown commodity, and then they lose Walker and um, uh, Autry, which is a big blow. So, so yeah, it's, you know, some head-scratchers uh, defensively. Offensively, I'm, I'm happy that they get this... Uh, that they get Mac back, and it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a good situation. So, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how the rest of the free agency pans out for, for the horseshoe. Yeah, I am too. I mean, it's just like what I guess for me what's <clears throat> what's frustrating is that yeah, we we all know the the Colts are going to sit out the uh, first big round of free agency. They always do. That's no problem. You he, you know, you know Chris Ballard's not going to overspend and I'm totally okay with that. I I agree with that because you look at the Patriots and they're just throwing money around left and right and guess what? That's going to come back and bite them in the butt here eventually. So I, you know, I don't want to be that uh, that kind of franchise just throwing money at around like that. But this, when you see some of these guys at the Colts, where you know you look at as great options for the Colts, and you see them signing one year, two year deals for super cheap, and it's like, what? It, you know, if we were interested in them and they were actually talking to us, what in the world did we offer them? Did we offer them a bag of potato chips and a stick of bubble gum? I mean, seriously. What, if that's what they ultimately ended up signing for, what did we offer? Right. And if you heard the comments from Danico Autry today, it does not paint a really good picture of the negotiating skills or the negotiation process for Chris Ballard. It's here's what we're offering. Take it or leave it. If you leave it, okay, bye. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you type thing. And he was, you know, ultimately pretty upset with how that, was handled considering he gave some pretty good years to the Colts here recently and they basically lowballed him. Um, yes, I understand Chris Ballard's waiting and needing to get has some pretty big um, extensions coming up. I totally understand that. That's why I don't want to see the Colts throwing money around. But when there's areas of need and you're bringing in guys that are, you know, fringe depth pieces potential practice squad guys it's like come on man yeah like you're it's like we're, we're okay with you we're okay with running it back it's like you got bounced in the wild card round what are you talking about like and then you got your owner up there talking about oh i see a golden era on the on the verge for the colts man not with this roster you don't I mean, there's there's holes, there's holes. There's, there's no golden era coming anytime soon unless you're willing to do what needs to be done. You can't just keep drafting, because some of the areas of need you keep drafting and you've missed on those areas. Corner, uh, uh, for instance. I mean, seriously, we keep talking about cornerback, 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 cornerback as an area of need, and you're it's you keep drafting it. And it's like they, these guys aren't panning out. So maybe it's time to go out and. You know, you should have looked at a Kyle Fuller a little bit longer. Yeah, he was probably going to command a little bit too much for you, but at least try to get in on it. I mean, and then pass rush. Oh, Isaac Rochelle, I mean, look at he's No, no, he's not. He's not going to do anything. You Are you really okay with running it back with Kamiko Toure and Ben Benagu as your – edge rushers you're not you haven't even brought back justin houston who who's put up almost 20 sacks over the last two seasons i mean come on something's got to give eventually i mean you can't keep you you can't run it back you really can't because did we truly get better at quarterback we don't know and as of right now zach pascal's not back in the building ty hilton's not back in the building paris campbell's an unknown with injuries you got michael pittman I mean, yeah. seriously, 
something needs to happen. I mean, Will Full. I guess the the one that really stands up to me is Will Fuller at wide receiver, signing a one year deal for under like eight, like eight million. It's like, are you serious? We couldn't have offered that. We could. I mean, it's one thing to like, yeah, you don't want to get into long term money because you got you need to make those extensions for those big names. I get it. One year, eight million. Stop. That's that's being too frugal. Too frugal. That, that, that's re, that's getting a little bit ridiculous. I mean, yes, there's still names out there that the Colts aren't even in on. It doesn't seem like the Colts are in on anybody. Uh, yeah, I know. Wednesday they're bringing in Sammy Watkins. That's really the first time you've heard of really anything. And then for them to go out and sign this Dobby, I mean, the Dobby, the Dobby, the house elf. I mean, seriously, who is this guy? I mean, you brought in at least Julian Davenport a couple of weeks ago. What happened there? I know he's kind of a bust, but he would have been at least a better depth piece than Dobby or whatever his name is. I don't know. Sam Tevy. <laughs> yeah. Sam Debbie. Yeah. D- Debbie, little Debbie. Oh, um, I mean, that's probably why he's on the old line. He couldn't put down the damn snack cakes. Um, I mean, seriously, it's like, okay, great. We brought in a practice squad player that we could have probably brought in post draft. I mean, come on. It it it, it, does, it it is frustrating. It's not that I want to see them go out there and be big spenders because that's not the way to go. That's really not the way to go. But at least do something. Yeah. And it, you know, I mean, heck, there's players like Ryan Kerrigan sitting out there right now that at this point in his career, putting him back his with his hand in the in the dirt is exactly where he needs to go with his career. And having a defensive coordinator like Matt Eberflus to let him loose and let him do his thing. I mean, there's options like that that are out there. Okay, we need some depth at safety and corner. Well, guess what? There's a guy sitting out there named Ricardo Allen that uh, he's pretty darn good. He was a starter at, uh, in Atlanta this past, the past couple of years that he was a cap casualty. I mean, look at those types of guys. It's, it, it's really, there's so many options out there and you just kind of feel like the Colts are just like, we good. Yeah. Like, really? No. No, we we not good. We we not good. We need to. Now I understand. Yeah, you, are you going to go out and spend a bunch of money on an offensive ta- a left tackle? No, because there's going to be a plenty of talent right there landing in your lap in the draft. And even if you trade back and pick up more draft picks, there's still going to be that talent there. So I'm not too concerned about that position. I'm looking at the other positions like okay, now we need edge rusher because we're we haven't brought back Justin Houston yet, which we should. Okay, we need cornerback help because obviously Rocky Yassin's never going to get better and who knows what else we have. I mean, luckily we brought back Xavier Rhodes, but we still could use a little help there. Not like we were uh, shutting people down last year. Um, you know, safety, you know, we're letting Malik Hooker walk. So <laughs> what do we, you know, and George Odoms hasn't walked back in the door yet. He's not happy with the Colts because of the, they put too low of a tender on him, he thinks. So it's like, what? Wh- we need more help than you are actually I mean I'm sure he has a plan but at this point it's like you know the benefit of the doubt starting to go out the door in my opinion just because I mean I, I like I said I get the needing to hold something back for your big name players for their extensions because you don't want to see those guys walk you don't you can't replace big Q you can't replace Darius Leonard it's going to be tough to replace Braden Smith I get that. I totally get that. But passing up one year deals for somebody that could be a big difference maker. Now I could also understand the Will Fuller thing because he is suspended for the first game of the year for PEDs. So there, there's some question marks there. But, but eventually you're going to get to a point where like those big names that you want to re-sign are the only people there and, not, and nothing yeah. else around them because you've – not you've either you know pissed enough people off to where they don't want to play for you anymore or you're just bringing in you know placeholders until the next big thing hits so yeah, yeah I, until I, you find that until you get you land that next darius leonard in the draft it's right like, well there's not always going to be those types of players there's more busts than there are booms in the NFL draft, unfortunately. Right. I mean, you look at the outlook for the rest of free agency for Indianapolis. What I want to see them do is I want to see them re-sign Justin Houston as well. Heck, at this point, bring back T.Y. Uh, there's no reason not to, especially now that they haven't gone and re-signed other, you know, looked at any other wide receivers. Like you said, Sammy Watkins is set up for um, 
a visit. A visit, but am I wrong in being like at this at that point you might as well just He's bring back T.Y.? TY. I mean, yeah, but I mean, at the, are, know, they're essentially you, the okay, same so wide you receiver. Really get, you could get Sammy Watkins in on a one-year, three, four million dollar deal. I'm all for both, but if you're only gonna oh, yeah, if, totally you're, if you're only gonna re-sign one or only gonna sign one, you might as well just bring back T.Y. because of familiarity. You, you know. Well, you know, if you're looking to sign two receivers, I'm talk. I'm thinking, bring back Ty and Zach Pascal. Right. Zach yeah. Pascal, essentially, Zach Pascal is a younger version of what Sammy Watkins could be. And also, Sammy Watkins is like he's taken from someone who's tried to take flyers on him in fantasy football every so Sammy often. Walk- okay. In fam- his defense, Sammy Watkins was highly underused and undervalued in Kansas City. Yeah. Right, no, but I'm I'm just saying from like he's been he's injured all the time, like maybe that's it. or maybe he's just I don't know because I mean, he had a couple of really great seasons with uh, Buffalo, and then ever since he was with Buffalo, he's not really been able to do very much. And like you said, he was underutilized in Kansas City, but also like he's suffered a lot of injuries too. So um, and 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 that's kind of the point too. Like he and Ty are. Very similar wide receivers, very injury prone wide receivers as well. So if you're gonna bring one back, you might as well. Or if you're gonna sign one, you might as well sign the one that you're more you know used to and you can you know have a familiarity with as opposed to you know it, it, if you go sign Sammy Watkins and not get Ty, it's basically like the Cubs this year getting rid of Kyle Swarber and then signing Jock Peterson. They're event- essentially both really you know so, you know they're both the home run. Guy. They're the same guy. One may, one might be a little thinner, but other than that, like they're the, they're the same player essentially. Um, but yeah, I want to see that. I want to see the Colts sign either Melvin Ingram or Jadavian Clowney. I know there's not a likelihood that they get Houston and another one of those guys, but I'm really kind of because you know we talk about pass rushers. I mean, why not? You know, it's like the commercial says, why not both? Why not go get Justin Houston and then another guy like a Melvin Ingram, like a Jadavian Clowney? And then I mean, you said they wouldn't do this, and you're probably right. But heck, I mean, go if it's go see what the price tag is for Eric Fisher or Alejandro uh, Villanueva. Um, see what those asking prices are going to be. Because, I mean, guess what? There's a lot of teams that need O-line help. And if if you can get your guy, you know, you're a proven guy, not somebody you have to draft and, like, say, hey, everything says he's going to be awesome, but we'll have to wait and see. You know, get that proven commodity and then trade. I mean, you know, do something or trade picks and acquire somebody. Do something. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, that's what I kind of want to see them do. Will it happen? I don't think so, um, but well, mostly because left tackles do com- like starting caliber left tackles do command a, a hefty price on the open market. So that's why I, I say I kind of lean away from that. So for me, I'm I'm looking more at yeah, bring back Justin Houston, try to bring back Ty, um, especially now that you have I, I think with Carson Wentz, I think Ty could have a really good reemergence. I, I've already mentioned a couple other players. I would love to see Ryan Kerrigan because he's getting up there into the end of near. He's not near the end of his career. He's you know he's he's my age, which yeah, it's old. But I mean, it's not that. I mean, football wise, he's 32, 33. So you know, like I said, he's not the outside linebacker that he was for. He won't be an outside linebacker like he was for the Washington football team. But when he played his best. He was at when he played his best at Purdue. They had that all those All American years. He um, was a, a hand in the dirt defensive end, and that's you know kind of where his bread and butter is. So bringing him in and putting him back in a four three with his hand down in, in, the, in the ground, I think would be really beneficial to him. A couple other players to look at on the defensive line because Ballard does love the trenches, which I, I'm glad he does. Um, Sheldon Rankins from the Saints. Um, good young player um just kind of needs a new fresh start you know we've seen that before and another one from the carolina panthers kawan short he's from indiana uh, from northern indiana he's got a lot of ties here to the state um he would be a, a really good solid defensive tackle to bring in and to replace the nico autry uh a guy that's a good run stuffer to put, he would really complement um the force buckner very well so there, there's some guys that to look at. If you're looking at s- secondary, like I said, Ricardo Allen, he's he's going to come pretty cheap. He's got that starting experience. 
Uh, heck, he even started in the Super Bowl for yeah. the Falcons. Is so. he the one that had the interception uh, on – did he get the pick yeah. six on Brady? Yeah, that's what I thought. So, was it the pick six? Or was he the one that the ball bounced off of him on that amazing Julian Edelman catch? I think that was it. I mean, maybe both. I don't remember. Maybe but... both. But, <laughs> you know, Ricardo Allen is a very, very, very solid player. Um, and one of those good good locker room guys. So all, all three of those guys I mentioned, are, or all those guys I have mentioned are good locker room type guys, so they'd be great fits for the Colts. Um I, but I am surprised that the Colts are just signing these random people this early in free agency yeah. when they those, these random people would have hey. been around probably after the draft. Let's God, just be gotta go. Hey, you, you gotta go. You gotta lock down Sam Tevy when he comes available. All right, Sam, Sam Tevy. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, he's got to he's got to get that practice squad position oh, warmed up. Oh, 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 Sammy. It's gonna be the turning corner for the gonna be the turning corner for the Colts. He couldn't even brought back old Joe Hag. Yeah, true. I mean, come on, man. It's one thing about it's one thing to be frugal. It's another thing to be cheap. Right. And that, we're getting we're getting into that territory. We're getting into cheap. Right. Yeah. I mean, you look at uh, the rest of the league as we kind of look around the league. It's been a busy week. Um, you know, a busy, you know, a little over a week, I guess it's been now. But Kyle Fuller signs with the Broncos, one year, nine, uh, nine and a half mil. Kenny Galladay signs with the Giants, four years, 72 mil. Juju returns the Steelers. Will Fuller signs with the Dolphins. Washington signs Curtis Samuel. I threw that in because you, yeah, you had talked about Curtis Samuel. Yeah. He's got a lot. Uh, they, the Washington football team acquires Ryan Fitzpatrick as well. AJ Green to the Cardinals. Uh, that the Arizona Cardinals continue uh, to be kind of the retirement home of the NFL. Um, and then you have um, the Giants also adding Kyle Rudolph and John Brown. John Brown, another disappointing thing in the sense that that's another guy the Colts had there. He wanted to play for you, the Colts. Yeah, he's like, can you guys please play me? And the Colts are like, no, we're good with our no and wide you receivers. you want to play for us? Uh, we pay you $5. They, they, you know, I, I talked about the Colts $5? rebuild being um, being like the, uh, the Cubs rebuild. Um, and this is starting to turn out that way when it's like guys are coming to the, you know, guys came to the Cubs and said they wanted to play for the Cubs and the Cubs were like, nah. And that's how the Colts are right now. They're, they're, uh, <laughs> they're like, Hey, you want to play for us? But nah, you're, you know, that, that, you know, decent salary that you, uh, want, Ooh, we just can't you, pay you. We want to make some money. Nah, we don't Ooh, do that hard here. Pass, man. Hard pass. Um, we're we're in the bit we in the uh, financial peace university dave ramsey program up over here man <laughs> uh and then of course the new england yeah, patriots the new, that, that snowball the new england patriots they got that stimmy and they just went off uh they get johnny smith hunter henry nelson aguilar matt judon uh and a host of other names which was crazy and i knew i knew talking about the giants was going to get uh some of the people in the chat going uh nikki big giants fan so uh shout out to nikki as the giants have indeed made made some moves this off season um but yeah i mean you know you look at the what the colts did uh you know it's unfortunate they missed out on fuller and galladay and then also um you know well, both Fullers, Will Fuller and Kyle Fuller. Um, they could have got Curtis Samuel. You know, a lot of those guys on, that I listed there, the Colts could have gotten, and that's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> um, you know, but you know, because those could have get, been game changers. Um, the Patriots are going to be scary again. Um, you know, as much for as how we don't. Long, though? Oh, for how I long, mean, though? they're not going to be. One. They're not going to be a dynasty for twenty years, but they're going to be good. But is Cam Newton going to be healthy enough? And like. Is Cam Newton going to be able to do it? Well, I mean, I think... Or are you going to put all your eggs in the basket on Mac Jones? I mean, hey, I mean, it, it could happen. How many of those Alabama quarterbacks have panned out? <laughs> I mean, uh, let's see. When's the last... What? Who's the last Alabama quarterback to pan out? I'm trying to think. I Did Joe, I mean, Na did Joe Namath two, go to Alabama? Did Joe... Joe Joe Namath went to Alabama, didn't he? I can't remember. Yeah, I want to say that sounds right, but I'm not sure. Um, Alexa, where did Joe Namath play football? Oh my god! <laughs> Joe Alexa, where did Joe Namath play <laughs> college football? Should have been more specific. Hey, let's go! Hey. 
Yes. <laughs> you, ever, you ever got a question, you, you just you just ask her, and she's got the answer. <laughs> that, that was awesome. Uh, also being informed by Nikki in the chat as well that uh, and, uh, Adderie jo- Jackson has come to the Giants as well. So the Giants out here making some moves. big money moves. Um, and so, yeah, and that actually brings me into the next thing. Oh, real quick, cool, last thing on the Patriots, though. They're going to be in the playoffs again, and the battles between them and Buffalo, who also got Emmanuel Sanders, that's going to be fun. Uh, that you know, And that's what I was getting ready to get into, is that like both Eastern divisions are going to be fun to watch. I'm really excited to see. I think Washington's going to be a sneaky good team, because, I mean, you think about how good um, Washington was when Alex Smith came back. They've got a good defense. They add another wide receiver in Curtis Samuel and Fitzmagic. I mean, that's going to be fun to watch. The Giants, I mean, remember, they're going to have Saquon Barkley come back, and they kind of were in the same boat. The Washington was in in the same uh, standpoint as they just needed to kind of add some guys on the offensive side. The defense is there, um, you know, and... You know, as much as we like to say the Cowboys are going to run away with the division because every year the roster is just the best in the NFC East, once that roster has to set up, you know, set up on the actual football field, it never seems to pan out the way uh, that it should go. So, I mean, the NFC East is going to be fun. The AFC East between the Bills and the Patriots is going to be fun. Um, you know, AFC North is going to be fun. I mean, there's a, I'm as excited for the NFL season as I was for the NBA a couple of years ago when, like, the Clippers got Kawhi, AD went to the Lakers, Russell Westbrook went to the Rockets, all these, you know, different, you know, it was, it was panning out to be a great season. And of course, that, I think that was the same season that COVID happened. But, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, you were excited because there was a bunch of great storylines going into the year. And I think that's what, uh, this offseason, um, has done. And then you look at the West, I mean, the NFC West. Um, the, the, the Cardinals added A.J. Green and J.J. Watt, which could boost them to the same level as um, the Seahawks and uh, Rams. So, I mean, uh, there's a lot of intriguing stories that free agency has cultivated and what could make a very, very fun uh, NFL season to watch. Yeah, I think it will be. <clears throat> um, just kind of hoping the Colts uh, get all get their snowball, that snowball done and are able to actually bring in uh, more than practice squad players because uh, I would like for the Colts to make it past the wild card round this year. Yeah, I mean it'll be it'll be I'm I'm interested to see what they're able to do. I mean because yeah I mean but I mean hey they were I mean you talk about the Colts getting bounced in the wild card round. I mean they um, they just so you know breaking news. Um, Michigan beat LSU. The Big hey. Ten has won in the Sweet 16. We got them, boys. We're, we're good. Go blue. go blue. Let's go. Carrying the banner for the Big Ten. I mean, hey, you know what? Maryland could beat Alabama, and we could have two teams. But they're, I, I mean, they're a physical team. Yeah. Um, cause that would that put the Big Ten on the same level as the SEC? Because the SEC, no, the SEC, uh, no, is this the yeah? So the SEC just has Arkansas and Alabama left, right? Because Tennessee is gone, Tennessee's gone, the LSU is gone, gone, Florida's gone. Yeah, so gone. yeah, because there's only like five teams. Because the Big Ten had the most teams from, uh, I think they had the most teams of, of any power conference. Nine, well, nine. So, um, and then only one makes it to the Sweet Sixteen. Well, Let's go. We don't know about Maryland. That's we true. Don't know about Maryland. That's true. TBD. TBD. Um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we talk about the Colts being a first round exit. I mean, they were though right on the verge of beating the bills in in buffalo so i mean it's not like they went to the wild card round and got their doors blown off so i mean uh i you know but of course that was with mo- a lot of the players that they have not brought back so <laughs> we'll just see um but yeah i mean and, and what's funny too you know just one kind of last little you know ribbon we'll tie on it before we get to our prediction for what we think the, will happen in the rest of free agency um i it, it's kind of interesting to me that like both conferences are going to be fun to watch um for different reasons the nfc will be fun to watch because there are so many like there's it has the potential. I don't. I don't. There, there's so many teams that are kind of like right there. I think the AFC has better teams, and so like it'll be like, man, you have to be really good to to make the playoffs in the AFC. Like you have to. You could be ten and six and potentially not make it. Whereas in the NFC, it's like, you know, it's gonna be fun to watch because they're all gonna beat up on each other, uh, and we'll see what kind of comes out at the end of the day. Because I mean, I don't think anybody from the NFC East or the you know nfc 
South or North have the capability. The, the NFC West has the most capability of turning out a, uh, a Super Bowl contender or somebody in, who could potentially go into the Super Bowl against the, you know the Chiefs or whoever comes out of the AFC. But I think there's of like they got to get through the the Bucks. Right. I mean, because I mean the Bucks carry the banner for the South, especially now that Breeze has retired. Because I mean, I don't. I mean, jury's still going to be out on Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill, whoever takes over the quarterbacks uh, there. Who knows what the Panthers are going to be like? Who knows, um, you know, what the Falcons are going to look like? So, I mean, I expect the Buccaneers to have a strong year. But as far as, I mean, you know, I think there's going to be, I mean, the West, I mean, you could make an argument about how the 49ers could potentially, I mean, they, they lost some talent as well. So maybe not necessarily that, but I mean, there's an outside world where, you know, the things go just right for the 49ers. I mean, that's potentially a four team race and then a three team race in the NFC East. So it, it's going to be wild. It is. We'll see. Who knows? The Colts may surprise us here in the next few weeks and uh, go on a, a, a spending spree. Yeah, I mean, looking at possibly the rest of free agency, I usually, when I when we switch gears from the Colts to the rest of the league, I try not to make like a prediction that is based on the Colts, but that is my prediction for the rest of free agency. The Colts, I think they do sign Melvin Ingram. I think, you know, they have an opportunity. Well, hey, I mean, it, it fits. Yeah. Chargers. It it, it does. They could get Melvin Ingram. They could get, um, you know, I still want them to re-sign, like, T.Y. and bring back Justin Houston. I mean, I don't see why they shouldn't go out and get. I mean, I know, like I said, a couple players from the same position group, but I don't, I mean, it's not against the rules, so why not do it? Um, So, you know, bringing in a guy like Melvin Ingram, uh, that was, of those guys on on the list I gave earlier, you know, Eric Fisher, Villanueva, um, you know, and then on the defensive side with Clowney and, and Melvin Ingram, those the, he's the the best player that I feel like the Colts are most likely to get. Um, you know, other moves that you can see make, like, heck, I could see um, I could see the Seahawks going and signing Sammy Watkins, um, you know, try to appease um, Russell Wilson. He's, it's another, basically, you have your big wide receiver in DK Metcalf, and then you go get another Tyler Lockett caliber wide receiver in uh, Sammy Watkins and maybe add, I mean, heck, you could see the Seahawks sign, uh, you could see them sign, you know, Watkins and then one of Fisher or Villanueva potentially as far as, you know, getting that line shirt up. Because yeah, the Seahawks sign T.Y. That's true, yeah. I mean, I think the Seahawks are going to do something because that relationship with Russell, why I don't think it's ending, could is, is definitely on thin ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, they could definitely make a move that uh, they need to make a couple of moves and then have a solid draft to kind of appease Russell Wilson and give him what he's wanting. Yeah, so my, my prediction, uh, I already said what I think the Colts are going to do. Um, my big prediction is I got Jadavian Clowney heading to Baltimore. Baltimore needs to place, replace Yannick um, and Gakwe, and I can see them going the um, – Jadavian Clowney route with that one. I think that would be a good fit for him. I think, you know, a team that's known for defense would be a, a good yeah. stop for him. I like it. I like that pick. Uh, well, that will do it here for this week's edition of the Crash Course Podcast. Remember, uh, you can watch us uh, on Twitch every week, twitch.tv slash 3C Media. You can like us on Facebook, Crash Course Podcast. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel, 3C Media. Uh, we are putting out an MCT podcast that, you know, they you know every week, YouTube exclusive. Those guys are killing it, as well as, of course, you see, uh, you know, the video edition of the regular podcast as well. So go over, subscribe. We're at 29. So be lucky number 30 i don't know if 30 is a lucky number but it might be to some people so go uh subscribe to us on the youtube channel crash uh 3c media almost said the crash course podcast but it's not that anymore um and then of course you can uh go follow us on twitter at crash course fm and then of course you can listen on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify wherever podcasts can be heard you can hear the crash course podcast we will be doing our major league baseball preview uh next week uh, for the Crash Course Podcast. That's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk a lot of baseball on that one. Obviously, it's going to be a fun one. We'll make our predictions for the season. Um, one of our highest uh, watched podcasts uh, is the uh, spring training one that we did a, f- a few weeks ago. So thank you guys for supporting that. And I hope you're excited uh, for our, our regular season preview as well. So a lot to get into there. But until then, have a good one, everybody.